I was invited to give the keynote address for this morning. Um, I thought about it, such a daunting task, and so genomics has expanded so much in recent years, in the last 10 years or 20 years. Uh, so what I thought I sh the best thing I can do is to not to spend time talking on, in the only time available, I think we have like 25 minutes or something, each person. Um, but to, to take a step backwards and look at a more broader issues of the field of genomics, including uh, regulation, some of the important applications, but more importantly also, some very recent advances. In the, uh, when I say very recent, I'm talking about in the next last uh, couple of months, two or three months. So I tried to look up uh, various uh, items of progress genomics has made, and I'll say a few words, and uh, I'm sure other people here probably have uh, um, a greater knowledge of some of these specialized topics. Uh, and I, I know that from seeing the program, I know uh, some of you will be talking about cancer genes, for example. Others may talk about um, uh, gene therapy or synthetic biology or tumor genes and so on and so forth. That's fine. So to start with, uh, uh, what I thought I would do is a general, very general outlook. First, we some of the major issues in genomics, when we think about genomics, if I have left out something, uh, uh, somebody can uh, tell me that uh, later on we can talk about it. Uh, vaccine development is, in my own mind, I'm sure each one of us probably sees this differently, but the way I see it is I think vaccine development is really the most urgent problem today. As uh, many of you know, malaria vaccine, malaria is, the mo is a deadly killer. Is the, is the, it kills more people than anything else every year, particularly in Africa. I know we don't feel malaria here in this town or in this country, but, but certainly if you go to Africa and Asia, uh, malaria is the number one killer in the world. Mostly children die of malaria every year. And uh, many companies, particularly I'll be talking about GlaxoSmithKline, GSK, uh, they've been working on developing vaccine and NIH has been working on vaccine development that has been uh, uh, very difficult, it's a very difficult problem, partly because the malarial parasite is uh, so diverse genomic, uh, genetically and it keeps changing all the time. So uh, every time you try to do something, it escapes uh, detection and uh, res develops resistance. Uh, drug resistance, for example. Then you have tumor genes, analysis of tumor genes. That itself is a huge field. Uh, uh, some of you probably will comment on that. Synthetic biology and genome evolution, which is a relatively young field, but still making very rapid progress in the last few years. Synthetic biology, especially my good friend uh, Craig Venter in uh, La Jolla and uh, his colleague Hamilton Smith, who received a Nobel Prize many years ago. They're working on this uh, synthetic biology, and there are many other areas, MIT, for example, many other institutions, universities working on this. Th and then finally, diagnostic testing. Now, that's some area that bothers me really. I think the genomic field has acquired some uh, bad reputation, actually, in the last uh, recent uh, few months or last couple of years, partly because, as, as I will be talking to you, some of the decisions made by the Supreme Court as well as the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, affecting diagnostic tests. I think uh, there's a great need to standardize testing uh, from independent laboratories uh, and maintain quality control of diagnostic tests. Gene therapy, of course, speaks for itself. That itself, uh, I, when I was a member of the NIH Advisory Committee on Recombinant DNA, we spent a lot of time on gene therapy, and uh, now I look back and say our methods were so crude in those days. This was 10 years ago. We really did not know actually what we were doing in those days. Now gene therapy has recent years has actually made a tremendous progress in HIV and uh, various other problems. And uh, finally, LC, you all probably all know LC, social, ethical, legal, and regulatory issues. We'll talk about all these things. Uh, I'll see what we can talk about, how much time we have. And uh, uh, here we are. Uh, s some of you may know the first biotech patent launched commercial biotechnology. All this interest in biotech industry actually started only in 1980. It's hard to believe it's so recent. Uh, when the uh, U.S. Supreme Court decided in, in the case of Diamond versus Jakarwarti, patent protection of a genetically modified life form of an oil digesting bacterium, Pseudomonas, that's when uh, many companies realized that uh, living organisms can be used 
uh, actually to make, to generate funds by, by a patents and so on and so forth. Until then, uh, uh, we were not sure if living uh, beings can be patented. And this was the first case that opened this. This is the Supreme Court ruling in June. Now, this is the, at the other end. That was a, the previous slide I showed you, the success of biotech. This one is actually the downside, the other side of it. The, compared to myriad genetics of BRC1 and BRC2, Supreme Court ruled in last June that uh, human genes cannot be patented, decision which with both the immediate benefits for some breast cancer patients and also long-lasting uh, impact on biotech research. It's a victory for cancer patients, research and geneticists because they were saying Myriad is holding monopoly over this patent for uh, breast cancer genes. So the cost went up a great deal. Um, now, uh, the FDA announced recently, this is the other problem, the, the second problem I was talking about earlier, regulating medical laboratory testing, saying that tests used to make important treatment decisions, they must be validated before they go into use. Uh, some widely used commercial tests have never had to be reviewed by the agency. One of them actually was Myriad's breast cancer risk test, uh, which, as I mentioned, is no longer valid. The patent is no longer valid. FDA's view of genetic test is, these are some of the problems. Faulty data analysis, exaggerated clinical claims. Uh, there is an example of that. I'm going to give you a couple of examples of private companies uh, who have made really serious mistakes uh, to show uh, why the FDA is now clamping down on testing and some other areas. Fraudulent data, lack of traceability, uh, change control, or poor clinical study design, unacceptable clinical performance. In fact, in many cases, uh, sometimes there is no follow through of, to see what, uh, uh, what is the impact of some of these tests and so on. Uh, that's what FDA was concerned about there. Uh, in terms of genetic testing, what do we mean? I I'm going back to fundamentals, I realize that. I'm going back to, back to basics, actually, uh, because we have had some problems. That's why I'm, I'm showing this. Uh, the term genetic testing covers array of techniques, including uh, the analysis of DNA, RNA, or protein. Tests are used as a healthcare tool to detect gene variants associated with specific disease or condition, as well as for non-clinical uses, such as paternity testing and forensic. In the clinical setting, we, t we are concerned with the genetic cause of a disease, confirm a suspected diagnosis, predict future illness, detect when an individual might pass a genetic mutation, to his family and, and, predict, and re reaction to therapy. Now, when we talk about DNA patterns, of course, as you all know, in the last uh, 20 years or so, we have made uh, tremendous progress. Many, many genes have been patented, DNA patterns. As you can see, the meteoric rise, only in the last uh, four or five years, there is a drop of the patenting. Um, let me see, next one, here we are. These are some of the major institutions in the country which hold large number of patents in DNA. And for number one is DuPont, number two is Roche. The third one is University of California, Monsanto, and these are some of the top companies and universities in the country which hold DNA patents. Now, another related problem we have also is biobanks or repositories for conservation, research, and data sharing these disease control biobank, biological samples from patients with specific diseases and healthy controls can be deposited and preserved safely. Population-based biobanks, there are different kinds. Population isolate biobanks, uh, where you deal with genetically homogeneous samples from a specific population isolate. Um, I think, for example, Icelandic population, I think, is a great example of that one. Twin registries, samples from mono and dizygotic twins. Infectious disease biobanks, samples from patients with specific infectious diseases. So these samples can be preserved safely and used for research and data sharing or whatever in the future, whatever comes. Uh, in the DNA, they have the Nafield Foundation in Bioethics in England, in UK. The more four major uses they, they have come up with, the diagnostic tests, uh, research tools, gene therapy, and therapeutic proteins. But they're very specific on, this is, I think, this is the problem I think some people have not focused. It's not just uh, diagnostic tests, it's inventiveness criteria needs stringent application. We have to be very careful what we do with this. Uh, then research tools, strict application of utility criterion. 
Gene therapy, identification of a disease-specific gene, should not be granted a product pattern, but rather encourage the invention of safe and effective methods of gene delivery. Therapeutic proteins are not the DNA sequence as such, but the protein described. Now, I come to an example, uh, which actually is not the best, uh, it doesn't put us in a best light. Uh, you, have you heard of some company called 23andMe? Some of you may have heard about this company in the last few years. Um, and well, I don't know how to say that last name, but Wojcicki, I call it, uh, co-founder of this company. Uh, she was married to the, one of the founders of Google company. So the company had a lot of backup in both in funds and other support. Uh, what they have done is this. The, this company, 23andMe, has prepared kits. Uh, I, I call this, in a way, the McDonald's of uh, gene testing, genomics. Um, what they've done is they asked people to give their saliva samples and mail it back to them, and they send them complete prognosis of uh, uh, likelihood of developing heart disease, cancer, and a number of serious genetic diseases, uh, just on the basis of this mail order uh, saliva. So FDA sent a warning letter saying, the, you, because you are marketing the 23andMe saliva collection kit and personal genome service without marketing clearance or approval violation of the FDA cosmetic acts, that's, that's the problem they were concerned. So they stopped doing that. Users can still purchase the $99 at home DNA kit, but they will not receive the health reports because they used to send the clear medical reports and uh, genetic prognosis. And they stopped doing that. Now they're only giving their ancestry report and uh, some genetic data, but with no clinical interpretation. Uh, gene but they did some, some good has come out of this because they found genes associated with Parkinson's disease, which is useful on looking at a large number of samples, 7 million variants. 13,000 patients with Parkinson's and for a control group, more than 100,000 people. So in that sense, that's been useful. Um, now, another company also which has given us, I think, a bad reputation for genetics is the Burlington Northern. It's a huge company. Uh, they began secret genetic testing of its workforce in 2000, hoping to prove a pre-existing condition to avoid paying workers' compensation costs secretly. Uh, then the EEOC sued them for discrimination based upon predictive genetic testing. This case is settled, was settled long ago in 2002 with Burlington. They paid some money there. To, you can see $2.2 million. There are ethical issues involved in all these matters. Actually, whatever issue you take up, the long list I showed you. There are ethical issues that are involved, informed consent, and ethical issues are very much involved. The ethics are, for example, sharing the genetic information. Uh, then confidentiality of the individual, privacy, that's what we call privacy, dissemination of genetic test results with the family, informing the family members the information, discovery of variation in a particular gene and its application, inappropriate application of genetic testing like sexing of the fetus, potential for discrimination with the use of predictive testing, impact of results on life insurance applications and employment, so that's where confidentiality is very important. Forensic DNA data banks ensuring that they are used for the purpose for which they were intended. Um, now, I know there are several people here who are associated with private companies or industries. Uh, industry university collaboration is extremely important. Uh, as you can see, each one has its own advantages. Uh, the companies are on the left. We have financial support, a broad experience uh, for students. They expose them to the real world problems, not just academic problems, and enhance regional economic growth and so on. I won't go through all this because I have a lot more to show. Uh, then on the right side is the university has expect, access to expertise and knowledge, not typically available in industrial laboratories. Oh, that's the, that's the industry, sorry. Aid, aid in the renewal and expansion of complete company scientific, science and technology base, this company. Gain access to the students or potential employees, gain access to faculty and uh, internal research capabilities and uh, opportunities for faculty and so on. Now, I come to what I think is really a very important problem, uh, application of genomics, is vaccine production. Right now, you know, you've been talking, hearing about Ebola vaccine in the last uh, few weeks, a very urgent problem now um, in Africa and uh, uh, with the fear that it might spread to other countries as well. Uh, but I'm happy to say that uh, in, genomics has actually, after a long delay, a long time of uh, um, research, 
um, for malaria, for example, and now Ebola. Uh, they're just about to, the vaccine is, uh, is developed and it's, they're doing test trials right now. They're just about to be used um, uh, in, uh, on the real populations in the near future. Ebola, Ebola vaccine, actually, both in Oxford, England, University of England, and uh, NIH trials for Ebola vaccine, uh, which, as I just mentioned, are fairly successful. They are just about, because there is no time to lose. This is a very urgent problem. People are dying every day, every minute. Uh, now, then is malaria. I won't say much about Ebola, but I'll, t I'll talk to you a little bit about malaria. Uh, this is endemic malaria, as you can see, the worldwide distribution in many countries, many parts of the world. And um, malaria statistics, I won't go into all. The, you all know that it's a, malaria is a major killer. Um, 60, almost a million people die every year of malaria. As I mentioned, although malaria used to be in the, here, but that's gone long ago, most of the malaria deaths occur in Africa and Asia. Uh, and uh, several companies have been trying hard uh, to develop CDC, estimates the direct cost from illness. Uh, almost cost around like 12 billion per year. The cost of malaria is very high, the human cost. And um, I don't know, um, this is probably a back in a, a lesson in uh, introductory genetics for students. Uh, malaria, many people may, may have forgotten, but malaria life cycle, the, uh, that's showing that mosquito is the carrier of the parasite, was actually discovered in India, in Hyderabad, India, by Ronald Ross in uh, 1902, he received the Nobel Prize. It's interesting, even though the life cycle was known actually since that time, so far we have really no vaccine that can be used on the population. We only just know it has become such a difficult problem, malaria vaccine development. So only now we are beginning to look at this. Life cycle of malaria was discovered, as I mentioned, by Ross. Uh, you have the various cycles here. This is the erythrocyte cycle. Here are the schizons are he here and trophozoites. Uh, they, they enter the liver of the human uh, target. And then here is the erythrocyte cycle. Here is the sporogonic cycle in the malaria. Different cycles. Mosquito stages, these are mosquito stages and the human stages, and human blood stages and so on and so forth. It's a very serious problem in the world. Malaria parasite, as you can see, destroying the blood cells. Um, here are the trophozoites, which is the... Now, when, the, when you talk about developing a vaccine, the genome sequencing, of course, uh, has opened the doors for vaccine production. That's one of the... Sequencing only uh, started seriously in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So that's one reason why we don't have a vaccine. But now we have that, that done, now vaccine production is possible. Also, you can attack the, the, the cycle at different stages. So one of the ideal stages they found is trophozoite uh, formation when it enters the, before it enters the liver of the human liver. Uh, here is the female Anopheles, which carries the parasite, mosquito. Uh, Anopheles genome is uh, 20, 230 to 284 million base pairs. It's comparable in size to that of the fruit fly, uh, Drosophila. And the genome has six uh, deployed with six chromosomes. Typical habitat of malaria Anopheles uh, breeding uh, mosquitoes. In, this is an example from Cambodia. As you can see, the water lodging uh, uh, makes it possible for breeding mosquitoes. Now, here is sequencing the malaria parasite. They cause us the most common form of malaria share the same genetic variation. Even when they are separated across many continents, Asia, Africa, and so on, you find the same genetic variation. This is both good and bad. The good thing is, of course, we are understanding more about this. The bad thing is the discovery raises concern that mutations to resist existing medication could spread worldwide. So if there is drug resistance or other resistance, this makes eradication much more difficult because they all share the same genetic variation. <clears throat> International collaboration resulting in malaria vaccine now, which is just now, actually, literally, I mean, in the last few weeks, uh, it's becoming successful. It's done by Oxford um, in University, uh, NIH, and the University of Maryland. The phase one trials will begin as soon as they receive ethical and regulatory approval. They have submitted the request for approval to be used uh, vaccine. So that's where it is right now. Um, but in England, particularly Glaxo, GSK has been very involved in this. As I mentioned, the, for many years, they've been trying to develop the vaccine. The regulatory submission is a first step towards launching 
um, um, ma malaria vaccine and malaria and predictions which will change the lives of billions of people around the world. Glaxo has submitted this uh, application. Genetic fingerprinting detected strains of drug-resistant malaria parasites. Previously, they were using some drugs. Artemisin is one of them, for example. But since we have drug-resistant strains are coming, so vaccination it becomes even more urgent. This is becoming more and more extremely urgent. Haldane, my mentor, was uh, actually a pioneer in uh, malaria. Uh, he was a genius in many areas, but he, one of his casual suggestions is, it's what's called Haldane hypothesis, is that uh, sickle cell carriers and thalassemia, they, they have greater resistance to malaria. This is actually, you no, know, Allison confirmed this in Africa, uh, this prediction. I'll show you one more slide on this, yeah. Sickle cell disease, homozygote, they are, um, the sickle cell and the heterozygous survivors, whereas the, those others without this, they die of malaria and so on. The point here is, I'm trying to say, is uh, there is a need to, great exam, need to examine this process uh, at the molecular level and see what exactly is going on so that this population dynamics can be used uh, for in, in terms of malaria therapy. Uh, I think that was my last slide. That's the last slide. And uh, how much time I have now? I don't, I'm not sure, but anyway. So what I, I just want to briefly sum up what I'm saying. Um, to set the keynote address, what I, what I want to do was to look at the broader field as a whole of various applications, which includes the intellectual property and patenting as well, uh, improving the quality control of genetic testing, because as FDA pointed out, there has been no, uh, there is no control over this kind of monitoring of this. Now they're, they just started this process, issuing. And as you can see, some of the private companies have been uh, misusing, actually, the genetic process and genomics. And uh, finally, when it comes to utility or application of genomics, um, uh, of course, we can all have our own opinion on what's more important. I mean, cancer genes is extremely important, of course tumor genes. But the immediate killers are cancer, besides cancer is malaria and other, Ebola, for example, and others. So vaccine development is a very urgent problem. So I'm happy to say, as genomic uh, research scientists, that uh, we, have, we are contributing to actually developing a vaccine. Uh, to me, I see that as a very major contribution of genomics to the population. Okay, I'll stop here now. Thank you. Um,